uh, can you just let me know you can see that? Yes, we can yeah, see. We see. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, I called my talk uh, a brief history of living machines. It's going to be um, a little bit of history, um, uh, but also a lot of uh, uh, comment uh, and uh, uh, a little bit of speculation. So. Uh, uh, as uh, Anna showed you, and you can see in her background, uh, we have uh, been here for 10 years doing these conferences. Uh, in this uh, slide, I'm showing uh, some pictures from the 2012 uh, Living Machines uh, Conference. Um, for those of you who, who were there and can remember, we had an exhibition at that conference in, in the London Science Museum, which was really quite an amazing event uh, and, and uh, created lots of memories. For me and it was uh, a, both a science engineering and arts event so we had uh, live performances of uh, uh, music that were composed by computer programs and also art which was developed by a computer artist and various forms of art which had some sort of living machine inspiration and i think that's another aspect of our field that we want to go across uh, from science and engineering into the arts and humanities and have an approach that's informed by all the disciplines. So the concept of living machines is to intended to bridge, first of all, the biomimetic and biohybrid approaches. I'll say a bit more about what those mean. Uh, and as uh, Paul said, to create new lifelike technologies, uh, which, which may be useful. Uh, and as many of you will know, because you, a lot of you contributed, in uh, 2018, we published the Oxford Handbook of Living Machines, which has 66 chapters. And if you don't have a copy, then it's still available from all good uh, booksellers. Uh, and uh, it really is a great book for introducing the field. In Sheffield, we are uh, teaching a, a, a third year course uh, based on this book, uh, myself and, and Michael Mangan, who's also here at the conference and, and is speaking later. So, um, uh, and, and during this talk, I'll be referring you a little bit to some of the chapters in that handbook. So uh, I think the technological complexity is converging with the complexity we see in biological systems. And this isn't just my own view. Um, uh, 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 John Doyle, uh, uh, who has written extensively about the relationship between biology and engineering, has made the same argument. And this is a quote from uh, a paper of his in Science in, in 2002, uh, talking about the Boeing 777 and the complexity uh, of the control systems that fly that aircraft. 150,000 different subsystems, uh, uh, roughly 1,000 computers. Um, so a, a vast network which is, which is involved in flying that plane. And uh, the 777 isn't unique. Many of our modern technologies have these huge networks of embedded uh, computers which are interacting closely with the physical hardware. And I, I share with John Doyle this view that, that our technology is com converging in the complexity, but also perhaps in some of the design problems with the biological systems uh, that many of us study. In biomimetics, uh, we uh, look at this relationship between uh, science and engineering. So in, in science, we do uh, something we might call an analysis. We look at complex biological systems and we try to understand them uh, through methodologies of experimentation uh, and decomposition. We try and treat these complex systems and break them down into the component parts and to understand how those different components work together to generate the behavior that we observe. Uh, following uh, uh, Valentino Breitenberg, we might call that activity analysis. Whereas in synthesis, uh, in engineering, we try and build things. And we try and uh, build things uh, out of component parts and, and we try and use principles that we've developed into engineering or borrow from science to try and work out how to construct things that have interesting behavior. And biomimetics is really the uh, integration of these two activities uh, using analysis to understand complex biological systems and using synthesis to build engineered systems that are inspired by the principles 
that we take from biology. And as this diagram shows, these two approaches uh, work together, they're synergetic. So the analysis informs the engineering, but the engineering also informs the science. And more than that, the synthesis can lead to a, uh, an output, a physical artifact often, which stands as an existence proof of our ideas uh, from the science. Indeed, you can take, you can think of the, the living machine that comes out of this approach, the physical system as an existence proof of our theory of the biological uh, system that we're trying to understand. And as Paul mentioned, uh, you can also go from there to application. And uh, uh, we're certainly doing that in Sheffield. As Paul mentioned, we have two spin out companies exploring the potential viability for societal applications of biomimetic technologies. And indeed, Paul is, is doing something uh, similar in his group, uh, SPECS, uh, via the Eodyne spin out, which is taking biomimetic principles and using them to develop new technologies uh, for healthcare. We're also in, in this conference interested in biohybrid systems. So these are formed by combining at least one biological part, uh, an existing living system, with at least one artificial component. And uh, what makes it biohybrid if information passes uh, in both directions, uh, so that the two things are connected uh, uh, as a system. And uh, uh, I think this is a very exciting and emerging field which we ho hope to highlight more and more in this conference as the years go on. So uh, Anna sh showed a version of this slide. We've been running this conference uh, now for 10 years. We've been uh, across Europe uh, and uh, really across the world. We've been to Stanford in the US. We've been to NARA in Japan. For the last two years, we've been online. Well, last year and this year. Uh, next year, we hope to have a physical conference but I think this mixture of online uh, and physical conferences may be a part of the future for living machines. Uh, we are uh, biohybrid, we're also virtual and physical hybrid in terms of our conference. Uh, and this is something I look forward to discussing in the coming days of how this, uh, this conference can grow and take advantage of these new technologies that are allowing us to connect across the physical world. So I said I'd mention a bit about the history of the field. I don't intend to uh, give you a blow by bow account of where biometrics come from, but of course we can point to some famous examples of its origins. One of those naturally enough is Leonardo da Vinci, uh, one of the original polymaths, a scientist, but also a great engineer and an incredible artist and uh, a man who made detailed observations of natural systems and used those to extrapolate towards mechanisms, uh, for example, flying aircraft that actually worked and also took those uh, creations uh, and built them and, and made them useful in society. So uh, da Vinci gives us an example of uh, what you can achieve in this field when you take this approach. Um, more sort of on the sort of philosophical understanding, of course, Descartes famously uh, proposed and was the first to explicitly say uh, that animals are complex machines. He, he stopped short of saying that uh, uh, humans could also be understood by this principle. Indeed, he's, he's remembered for his dualistic view uh, that humans were, were some combination of a uh, physical animal-like machine with an immortal soul but de la Matrie, uh, took that hypothesis and extended it to all life, including humans. Uh, and uh, for doing that, he was uh, actually um, forced to leave his home in France and, and go and live, I think, in, in, in the Netherlands. So it was a dangerous position to take at that time. And it still is uh, risky uh, to, to challenge orthodox views about uh, the nature of the human, but it's something that I think uh, we are bound to do in this field because of the societal impacts uh, that our work can have. And we'll come back to that later. So you can trace biomimetics almost to the beginning uh, of uh, civilization. Uh, this is uh, a illustration of 
perhaps one of the earliest biomimetic designs, a, a flying machine uh, developed by the, the Greek philosopher and engineer Architas of Tarentum, who is said to have, have made a self-propelling flying machine, which was made of wood uh, and powered by, uh, by steam. Uh, and it was structured so as to resemble uh, a bird. And, and it was, it's thought that this um, uh, artifact flew a, along a wire. It wasn't sort of uh, completely uh, free flying. Uh, but he demonstrated uh, the possibility of, of a artifact, a man-made object uh, that could move in a, a manner that was similar to an animal, even uh, so long ago, fourth century uh, BC. But when we uh, look at biology, we're not looking necessarily to, to explore uh, a form. So Architas was maybe inspired by the form of a bird, but when we want to understand flight uh, or other attributes of uh, uh, biological systems, we need to look before, both look beyond the superficial form and try and understand the principles that are operating beneath that. And uh, of course, that uh, approach underlies success of many uh, technologies, including flight. And the first plowed flight by the Wright brothers was inspired in, in some part by study of uh, biological systems and how, for example, birds can glide. If we look at the principles underlying flight, we see there are many uh, uh, examples of principles that we can extrapolate from nature uh, to artifacts. So one of these is the, the flying power curve, which shows that because uh, in order to fly, you must generate forces that counteract uh, both gravity and aerodynamic uh, drag, there is a, a sweet spot uh, for uh, speed uh, against the amount of power you need to stay airborne. So flying slowly, uh, hovering like a, a hoverbird uh, and, and flying very quickly are both uh, relatively expensive. Uh, and there's an intermediate speed uh, where you optimize uh, uh, your power use. And th this has been explored in, in many artifacts. This is a, a diagram from the chapter in our handbook uh, by Send. Uh, and it looks at uh, the development of bio-inspired flying machines. This, uh, this is a really nice uh, diagram from uh, that paper uh, showing um, the relationship between biological organisms uh, and, uh, uh, and airplanes of, of all different sizes uh, in, in terms of this um, measure called wing, wing loading, which is the relationship between the wing area uh, and the weight uh, of, uh, of the plane or the animal. And what you see uh, on the diagram is uh, uh, in the diamond shapes are birds, and many of these were collected by James Harting, which you see in the top uh, right-hand corner there, the on ornithologist, and looked at the relationship between uh, weight and, and wing area in, in birds. Uh, and you can see also on that diagram, airplanes, which are the squares, and of course, uh, most of the airplanes that we have are much bigger and much heavier uh, than birds. So you can see that they are uh, up there in the top right-hand corner of uh, this diagram. Uh, you can see that the Wright Brothers Flyer 3 is there and you can see many of the uh, uh, modern aircraft, uh, also the fixed wing aircraft. Uh, and what you see is a relationship also noted by, by Harting uh, as long ago, I think it was uh, 1869, uh, between uh, weight uh, 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 and wing area or wing loading um, and this straight line. And what you can also see is that um, whereas these uh, flying birds fall along this line uh, and these larger aeroplanes also fall along that line, most of the smaller uh, flying machines, including uh, Festo's Smartbird and, and Sandals involved in, in developing the Smartbird, uh, that falls significantly below this line uh, you can see these, these um, fill shapes here at the bottom. And so there are, it's clear there's still some way to go in understanding how uh, animals, how nature is optimizing flight so that you can minimize wing area uh, uh, and lift a certain uh, weight of body. So there's still much to learn about it, even the principles of flight, particularly uh, for smaller flying uh, vehicles. 
So another starting point for the living machines approach uh, is in systems theory. Uh, and uh, uh, I really like this book by von Bertalanffy, uh, who's uh, really a biologist, but took a systems theory um, from maths and engineering into biology uh, and uh, uh, was one of many people really to point out that living organisms are open systems, uh, systems that maintain a continuous inflow and outflow of energy across a boundary and thereby stay uh, uh, at a state uh, uh, of uh, uh, self-organization that was far from thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. So, and they do that by maintaining this through flow of energy to, to maintain stability and to maintain organization. Um, and similar ideas, of course, come from physics, Schrodinger, biology, Prigogini, and Maturan and Varela in, in cognitive science. And uh, if we look at uh, physical systems and biological systems, we see emergent order everywhere. And of course, there's a the famous example uh, of a physical system is uh, the belusov zabotinsky uh, reaction, which is uh, evidence, if you needed it, uh, that uh, a sufficiently complex system uh, in physics is likely to generate self-organizing uh, properties. So these rich and complex patterns that you see emerge in the BZ reaction happen not because there's any prescription, not because there's any uh, high level control, but because uh, the elements of this complex system interact in such a way as to generate order. And this principle of order through self-organization is critical for understanding complexity in biological systems and really important for uh, living machines, uh, science and engineering. And these principles of self-organization can also apply at multiple scales from the physical, as we see in the BZ uh, reaction, through to the chemical, and the biological uh, up to thinking about uh, living systems. We could say almost that it's practical in, in the sense that the same dynamical principles of dynamic, dynamical self-organization can operate at these different scales. And that's why the living machines approach must be a multi-scale approach. It must look at these different levels of self-organization and, and see whether principles operate in order to produce complexity in organization at these different scales, including uh, the human scale. And uh, dynamic, dynamical complexity uh, allows systems made out of component parts, which in themselves are relatively simple, to evolve uh, complex functionality, even to the point of uh, things that we think of as being uh, outside the physical realm, uh, mind, intelligence, intelligence and conscious, consciousness. And I like this uh, quotation from Marvin Minsky, uh, which uh, really underpins this point, that the mind is built from many parts, each mindless by itself. And, and this reminds us that if we're going to have a theory of mind or a theory of consciousness, it, uh, it can't be a theory that defines mind or consciousness in terms of uh, entities uh, or, or components that have mind or consciousness in themselves. I, I'm not uh, convinced by panpsychism, which sees consciousness uh, in, in atoms or in quarks. Um, we must have these high level properties emerge out of the combination and inter interaction of components that in themselves lack these properties. Otherwise, our theories of these things uh, are not explanatory. We must see, we must ex explore and understand uh, the emergence of complex properties, of higher order properties fro from these systems. And that I think is another goal of our research. And living machines are also cyber physical systems. And uh, it's exciting to see uh, the technology of cyber sy physical systems evolve in this direction, I think of, uh, seeing engineering as similar to biology as seeing, uh, and also seeing biological complex systems as, as similar to engineered ones. Uh, this is a de definition of a cyber physical system uh, from a 2014 uh, IEEE systems paper. So this is by uh, engineers writing that cyber physical systems are systems where physical and software components 
are deeply intertwined, each operating on different spatial and temporal scales, exhibiting multiple and distinct behavioral modalities and interacting with each other in a myriad of ways that change with context. And uh, in discussion with John Doyle, uh, I, we, we, we agreed that perhaps we can also view biological organisms, including ourselves, as a form of cyber physical systems. If, if we replace software here with information or computation, I think this definition can also apply uh, to animals uh, and humans. Uh, we are systems of deeply intertwined physical and computational uh, components operating on these different temporal and spatial scales. So, uh, and we, we can look at biology to discover principles uh, for the control of, uh, uh, of physical systems, including robots. And this is an area that I've been uh, working in for the past few decades, uh, as have many of you, uh, as I know. And these are some principles that I've been exploring. Uh, the notion that control should be robust rather than necessarily optimal. Uh, these aren't two uh, opposing things. You, you can, of course, optimize uh, for the worst case, which is a form of robust control. Uh, but that is, it appears to be what biological systems do. They're not necessarily um, uh, controlling so as to be uh, perfectly efficient, but they are uh, controlling so as to be robust in, in under many different circumstances. And that is something we're still struggling to achieve, uh, for example, in robotics. And uh, biological systems are also modular, uh, although modular in interesting and different ways uh, from many engineered systems. In particular, they're modular, but in a very distributed way that we're still understanding. Uh, they exhibit redundancy because one of the ways that you achieve robust control is to have different ways of solving the same problem and have different mechanisms that implement those solutions that if one mechanism or one approach doesn't work, then you can apply the other, or you have damage to one part of the system, uh, you have another uh, mechanism that provides backup. And also, and this is something we've explored a lot in our robotic models, uh, biological systems exploit layering. So they take complex challenges uh, and they address them uh, by building uh, different layers of control, which add increased capability uh, 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 as you add different layers. And, and we see in evolution and in development, uh, this principle of layering as being a way of, uh, uh, for complex systems to build themselves and to bootstra bootstrap themselves. And another principle is that th we often see what you might call uh, the bow tie or hourglass architecture, uh, what John Doyle has called constraints that deconstrain. I'll say a little bit more about that. And all of these can be understood within the broader context uh, of uh, ideas which are you know, very familiar to this uh, community, both of emergence, uh, that uh, the properties of the system um, uh, can go beyond the properties of its components, and of embeddedness, uh, that uh, it's often the case in biology that the, uh, the, the control problem is partly outsourced to the body, even to the environment, uh, taking advantage of the body and the environment structure and physics. Uh, and this is an idea, of course, that, that many people uh, have put forward. Uh, um, and Herb Simon uh, was one of the first people, uh, Simon, of course, one of the founders of cognitive science, to talk about, about this in, in uh, his book, The Sciences of the Artificial. He described the apparent complexity of the ant's behavior as largely a reflection of the complexity of the environment in which it finds itself. And we should always remember that when thinking about uh, building control systems, because often we can export part of the problem uh, of uh, building complex behavior into uh, the physical body or into the uh, body environment interaction as many studies that are presented at our Living Machines conferences have demonstrated. So just to go back to uh, lead control, because um, people often think of, of lead control as similar to uh, hierarchical control. 
Uh, and it is similar in that there are multiple layers and the top layers, layers can speak down to the lower ones. But I think there are differences in that uh, information from lower layers can pass to the higher layers uh, in a layered control system. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that the top level layer is always in control. Uh, often in biological systems, including, I would say, the mammalian and human brain, we see that uh, flexible control uh, is implemented at the higher levels, if, if you like, in the human brain in cortical systems. And faster forms, of, but perhaps more inflexible forms of control are implemented in the lower levels, in, in places like the spinal cord and the brainstem. Uh, and these fast systems are often uh, pre-wired. Uh, there are more innate components. And these slower systems that are often late developing uh, are often more adaptive. They take advantage of information uh, from the environment in order to, uh, to develop uh, and uh, provide more flexible uh, control that can, that can change with circumstances. And uh, layer control architectures also demonstrate robustness in that you can lose these high level layers and still have some uh, function uh, ret retained. And of course that has been demonstrated in robotics by many people, uh, Rodney Brooks, uh, a famous example of an advocate for layered control. And, and in layer control systems, we often see uh, abstraction layers. So the higher level systems don't have to have access to everything that is happening in the layer, layers below. And this is true in engineered systems, but it's also, I think, undoubtedly true in biological systems. For example, in biological vision, including in human vision, uh, we have uh, a, a visual system in, in the cortex, uh, which operates on top of a visual system in the midbrain uh, in an area called the superior colliculus. And uh, the, the forebrain has relatively uh, uh, li limited access to what's going on in the midbrain. So the, the midbrain superior colliculus can control eye movements, it can control gaze direction, it can do a lot of stuff uh, which it can do without the support and help of uh, the cortex and without the cortex even necessarily knowing that it happens. We know that because that in people with cortical damage uh, that uh, in many ways can no longer see, there is a form of vision called blindsight where the midbrain is able to control the eyes and command eye movements and command a certain number of visual behaviors without there being awareness that this is happening at the cortical level. So this notion of abstraction layers, I think, is important uh, for thinking across the many aspects of high level control uh, in, in brains, including consciousness. The fact that we're unaware of some of the things that our brain is doing is no surprise if you think that the brain has these abstraction layers uh, uh, and that, um, that perhaps what we think of as consciousness uh, is, is rooted in some aspects of cortical and thalamic circuitry, which may not be able to access directly operations that were going on uh, in the brainstem and in, in the midbrain. So another key idea I think which is important for our field is that of the hourglass or bowtie architecture. So John Doyle has written about this in the context of technologies. So if we think about, uh, for example, the ecosystem uh, of uh, mobile phone technologies, we have a, a wide variety of different apps that will run on your phone. Um, and a wide variety of different hardware, uh, different phones that can support those apps. But we have a very, very limited number of operating systems, just uh, uh, two, two major ones, iOS and Android, which allow the apps to access the hardware. Uh, and uh, Doyle describes this as a constraint that deconstrains because the, by having just a limited number of operating systems, uh, the apps can, you can have a, huge ecosystem of different apps, uh, which can operate on many different handsets without having to be concerned about uh, the details of how these things are implemented in hardware. Um, and I, I do think that bowtie architectures also exist in biological systems. And with uh, collaborators in Sheffield, including uh, Peter Redgrave and Kevin Gurney, we did a lot of work to understand how the basal ganglia operates, uh, for those of you that study neuroscience, you'll know that the 
the basal ganglia are a group of structures in the forebrain and the midbrain that appear to gate the access of control systems in the brain to the sensory motor systems that control uh, movement. And many other people have, have talked about this as well, including, for example, uh, Stan Grillner. And these, th these uh, gating systems, action selection systems, are highly preserved in the evolution of vertebrate brains. Uh, so almost certainly around 500 million years old. So our brain has this core architecture of layering, but also this hourglass system, uh, which is uh, we've had even from our first jawless vertebrate uh, fish ancestors. And uh, people in our community have modeled this and demonstrated it in physical robots. So this is a paper uh, from the, the, the Swedish group involving um, uh, Sten Grillner showing how uh, the basal ganglia can interact with brainstem systems uh, and uh, spinal CPG systems to control uh, swimming in a simulation or hardware model uh, of a jawless fish uh, like the lamprey. Uh, and in our own group in Sheffield, uh, working with collaborators, particularly in Bristol, we've looked at how led control systems, or if you prefer sort of nested loop control systems, underlie uh, the sensory, the active sensing behavior of mammals, uh, particularly uh, uh, mice and rats and how they use their whisker systems uh, and how uh, nested loops at the brainstem, the midbrain and the forebrain level are involved in processing those signals and forming loops back to uh, the actuators that control movement. Uh, and that, those processes are also gated uh, in our models by a, a simple, simple implementation uh, of basal ganglia action selection mechanisms. Uh, this is uh, the robot that we built uh, more than 10 years ago uh, called Scratchbot. Uh, a lot of you may have seen this movie. Uh, this is work by Martin P Pearson, working closely with Ben Mitchinson and myself at Sheffield to develop um, what we think is really quite lifelike active sensing behavior uh, for uh, this robot, uh, Scratchbot, uh, which can, uh, th there's no sensors on, on this robot other than the whisker-inspired uh, 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 tactile sensors that you see on its head. And this is uh, uh, the latest uh, robot that Martin has developed for working again with, with Sheffield inside the Human Brain Project called Whiskey, uh, and it, it's maybe not obvious, but Whiskey actually has two small cameras there. So we're looking at uh, vision touch integration uh, now in our uh, whiskered robots. And we also, you can see uh, on the snout of this robot, a micro vibrissal array, which is uh, um, uh, much closer to uh, the, the smaller whiskers that you see on uh, uh, animals. And, and that is, um, uh, a form of sensor called the TACTIP, which uh, Nathan Lepora, who I think is uh, here, has been involved in developing. So we're using, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that, he has a, a short presentation this afternoon. And we're using these um, kind of, uh, it's actually a sort of hybrid uh, tactile visual sensor. Uh, we're using that to try and emulate this uh, large array of uh, uh, short whiskers that we see uh, on the face of, of many mammals. So um, in our field, there are many areas that we're, we're working on. I want to briefly uh, touch on uh, a few of those. So I think uh, work around understanding evolution development is really exciting and important for our field. And this is also the field that many people call artificial life. And the goal is to capture the power of evolution and developmental processes to build new kinds of, of living machines. And I think there is lots of really exciting uh, work in this area uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it develop. Um, uh, we'll also hear in this, con uh, this conference, I think, and we have in many past conferences about uh, perceptual systems, particularly thinking of perception or as an active process and one that is, is based on uh, prediction. And here are some examples of active sensing systems, uh, which uh, we've highlighted in our conferences or in uh, our handbook. 
And of course, uh, many people at this meeting have talked about uh, uh, locomotion as being one of the principal uh, behaviors that uh, animals uh, need to express. And, and we've seen in our conference many different uh, approaches to understanding animal locomotion and producing locomotion in, in, in physical uh, living machines. And I expect we'll hear more on this today from our plenary speakers uh, and throughout the week. And uh, uh, bodies, uh, the design of the physical bodies uh, is important, as I've mentioned several times already. And I think our field and our conference has been an important place for people to demonstrate that and to highlight how uh, our, the work in our field is advancing the role of um, understanding the body, uh, morphological computation, if you like, in solving different uh, behavioral problems. Uh, and as Paul mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a psychologist by background, and I'm interested in what we might call synthetic psychology, uh, using living machines to try and understand uh, the psychological processes and properties of humans. And I've worked in multiple projects with Paul and with other people. Uh, this was one around the iCub robot uh, with Paul to try and understand many properties uh, of human cognition. In particular, I've worked on autobiographical memory most recently to try and create the capacity for, for memory in, in robots, uh, which emulates human autobiographical and episodic memory. So I wanna uh, quickly say something about biohybrids. So it's not an area in which I've worked, uh, but I think it's one that's, that's vitally important to our field. I've listed here some of the benefits. Uh, one of those is to leverage biological capabilities. Uh, also, we can improve energy efficiency, which is really important. We can make much smaller uh, living machines and we can address the, uh, the global and societal challenge of sustainability and recycling in technology. And we can also build technologies which are more human compatible. So, um, if we think about miniaturization, uh, these are some uh, beautiful videos uh, uh, which you can find on, on, on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, th this one on the left by Drew Berry and the one on, on the right by John Walker, um, illustrating uh, intracellular uh, uh, mechanisms, which when you look at them, really demonstrate how the cell is operating uh, as a, a living machine. Uh, these. Um, uh, objects which look uh, a bit like sort of uh, flexible robots are proteins. Uh, they are uh, motor proteins uh, which move around inside cells and do the work. And what you see on the, on, on the right is uh, a mechanism which uh, exists inside the mit mitochondria of cells uh, to, um, to manipulate uh, ATP, the, the molecule which is used to power uh, uh, or, or most of the behavior you see inside cells, including the movement of these proteins. Uh, and you see something that looks a lot like a pump or a rotary machines, which operates at this intracellular level. So these um, components are tiny. These, these molecules are just a, a few nanometers in size, but you can see that they look almost like legged machines in the way that they move around and, and, and walk and climb gradients and so on. So by understanding how cells operate at this level, we can understand the basis of actuation in biology. So these same systems that generate propulsion inside the cell also generate propulsion in muscles. Uh, and uh, muscles, of course, biological muscles are per kilogram more powerful than the motors that we have today. And sustainability is gonna be essential for our, our future technologies. So this is um, uh, some slides that, that, that Jose Haloy shared with me, and I think Jose will talk later today, uh, looking at the technologies that go into our smartphones and looking at how those draw on rare resources, including uh, rare earth minerals uh, and materials such as lithium and indium and so on. And uh, Jose has pointed out, and the last chapter of our Living Machines Handbook uh, by him explores the challenge that uh, 
that using these uh, rare earth minerals and other components of our technologies is going to create in the coming years and really quite soon that in the next decade some of these rare earth minerals uh, yttrium, uh, yttrium, indium and so on are becoming, becoming increasingly rare and we may need to look for uh, substitutes. We also need to look for more sustainable ways of building and recycling these technologies. And uh, Jose points out that uh, biological systems are made of the most common materials on Earth, uh, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and so on. Uh, these make up 99% of our bodies. Um, and uh, the rare Earth and the trace elements that we have uh, exist in a way that they can be recycled uh, when, when our bodies die and decompose, which is not true of existing technologies. So we can learn from biology how to recycle and reuse these components. We can also learn from biology how to compute with cells and uh, we can learn also to build biohybrid systems. And this is uh, work from Victoria Webster Wood, who I think is running a workshop uh, at this meeting, looking at how we can build biohybrid systems that combine parts of animals with parts, uh, uh, with, with uh, machine parts and there are many different kinds of animal machine hybrids. So I'm running out of time, I'm just going to skip through these slides, but really this was just to show how uh, prosthesis has been revolutionized in the last decade. So this is state-of-the-art uh, prosthetic systems uh, for uh, controlling uh, arms. This is a man with a spinal uh, cord in injury who's unable to control the movement below his neck, but he's controlling via thought these two uh, robot arms both in physical form and in, in virtual form and there's a a complete sensory motor loop there which is also feeling touched by other hands so this is the the rapidity with which this work is advancing as donna haraway has said uh, we are all becoming uh, cyborgs or she, she wrote indeed in in the 1985 so uh, uh, 40 odd years ago uh, uh, that we are all chimeras, fabricated hybrids of machines and organism. In short, we are cyborgs. Andy Clark has written uh, about the same idea that we are natural born cyborgs. And we need to get used to this idea that we are biohybrid and becoming increasingly so ourselves. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about uh, ethical issues because all of this uh, exciting work does raise questions about uh, societal risk. Uh, and there are some lines of research that we may, may want to choose not to pursue if we consider them to be too risky. And if we don't debate these things, then other people will. And I think it's important that researchers, that people that are doing this research have a voice and that we even raise questions uh, that maybe other people at the moment aren't taking seriously. Um, but with, that we think are important because they may have uh, significant long-term impacts. An example might be, for example, the discussion about robot rights that David Gunkel uh, is leading. And just come to the, back to this question of thinking about people uh, as living machines, which uh, Delamere uh, uh, talked about in a very brave way in his lifetime, uh, and that people are still nervous to talk about uh, the person as a kind of living machine. And I think the reason there is this nervousness is because of this feeling that science is reductionist, that it wants to explain everything in terms of physics. But our science is, is not a reductionist science. It's a multi-scale, multi-level science that notes the importance of emergent order. And that means that we don't reduce psychology to physics. Uh, concepts in psychology thoughts, beliefs, feelings, uh, consciousness, and so on, are properties of complex systems, which aren't there at the physical level. Uh, uh, they only happen when complex systems organize in the right kind of way. And this provides a new way to understand humans and also to take seriously uh, our societal properties that we care about. And as Guy Claxton wrote, there is a risk that, that we take this myth uh, which is almost a Cartesian idea uh, of uh, the dualist uh, immaterial soul. And we allow that to, to, to control our lives. He said the current myth 
of the body as a mobile pillar of meat piloted by an individual blip of conscious intelligence is false and harmful. The body and the self is a system of intricate dance of processes and interactions that depends for its existence on continual penetration and perturbation by wider systems of which it is an inextricable, inextricable part. So I think that can almost be a slogan for how in our field we think about humans and the human condition. And I know I've run out of time, so I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. Um, so uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, please announce yourself in the chat if you if you have any. So Tony, uh, then, then from my side, what for you is then the next critical step that we have to make in this field, right? So we, we, you give us a retrospective of, of the challenges that we're facing, but what's the critical next step that we have to make? Well, I, I do think that the uh, challenge that the world faces, uh, the critical one is, uh, uh, climate change uh, and technology is one of the biggest uh, cont contributors to global heating and our field is one of the places where we can find alternatives so that we can remain a technological society but in a more sustainable way and I do think that's where we should be putting effort and attention to to explore how we can create uh, biometric or biohybrid technologies which solve this challenge of sustainability and that includes anything from the building of the technologies to the recycling and dismantling of the technologies to using biohybrid components uh, and making use of biological parts in, in in systems i think in the future we're going to see much more biohybridicity because it's the only way to make these technologies really last and really operate for the long term mm -hmm. okay very good. Well, Tony,